Welcome to the second in my series of short podcasts about the stories of the Tudors. My name is Tony Riches and I'm a historical fiction author from Pembrokeshire in Wales and I'm a specialist in the history of the early Tudors. I was born within sight of Pembroke Castle and often visit the small room where it's said the 13-year-old Margaret Beaufort gave birth to Henry Tudor. I've also stood on the pebble beach at Mill Bay near Melford Haven, close to where I live, imagining how Jasper Tudor would have felt as he approached with Henry and his mercenary army to ride to Bosworth and change the history of Britain. These experiences made me wonder about Owen Tudor, the Welsh servant who married Queen Catherine of Valois and began this fascinating dynasty. And I must admit I felt a responsibility to research his story in as much detail as possible and to try to sort out the myths from the facts because there are huge gaps in the historical records which only historical fiction can really help to fill. As well as this, there are no surviving records of Owen's marriage, uh, no letters from him or to him, and no reliable image of him has yet been found. So after four years of detailed research, visiting locations, studying old documents, I'm pleased to say that the books in the Tudor trilogy have all become bestsellers in the UK, US and Australia. And these podcasts are about the stories I uncovered during my research. Henry Tudor is often described as the founder of the Tudor dynasty and I can understand that he was the first Tudor king but in this podcast I'd like to take you back much further to the original Tudor family in Wales and the amazing story of Owen and how he married the Queen and um, founded this dynasty. I recently visited the impressive medieval castle at Conwy in North Wales. It's a World Heritage Site and the massive castle dominates the little seaside town and harbour. It's an amazing location as the castle has views across the Conwy River and estuary out to the Irish Sea and the mountains of Snowdonia form an impressive backdrop. In the late 13th century, King Edward I really wanted to take control of the Welsh. They were fighting him along the coast and in the mountains of North Wales, which was really the heartland of the Welsh princes. So King Edward decided to build a ring of castles to suppress the Welsh raiders. And these castles were at Conwy, Rhythin, Carnarvon, Beaumaris on the Isle of Anglesey and at Harlech further down the coast. It is possible to visit all of these in one day. I think we did three of them in one day once but I'd recommend taking your time because each has its own story and is uh, fascinating to explore. For example Beaumaris Castle on Anglesey is where the real-life Duchess of Gloucester, the heroine of another of my books, called The Secret Diary of Eleanor Cobham, was imprisoned for life for witchcraft. And uh, it's a true story. Um, Like all of my books, I've used as much factual evidence as I can. And it was amazing to stand in her room at Beaumaris Castle and to visit her little chapel where she would have prayed. Harlech Castle also features in the second book of the Tudor trilogy because Owen's son Jasper uses it as his refuge in Wales. It was easily defended and really almost impossible to besiege. All these castles were designed by King Edward's master builder, a chap called James of St George. He was a master architect and builder of castles And in Conwy, they used a natural outcrop of rock. It was a small mountain, really, which made the castle impregnable. 
the Welsh would never be able to climb what were really vertical cliffs. And then you had the castle's 30 foot high walls and the siege engines that they might have used wouldn't be able to throw boulders high enough because uh, it towered over the land. The solid rock also stopped them tunnelling underneath to undermine the castle and the whole town of Conwy still has a wall around it to this day so the well defended harbour means it would be almost impossible to hold the castle to siege uh, because they'd be able to get supplies in and out fairly easily. What happened was that a Welsh nobleman you might have heard of, his name was Owen Glyndower. He rallied the unhappy Welshman to his banner and proclaimed himself Prince of Wales. Uh, among Owen Glyndower's captains were three brothers from the Isle of Anglesey, which is not far away from Conwy. These were Rhys Gwilym and Meredith Tudor. They were minor nobles descended from, directly descended from Lord Rhys ap Griffith, who was the original Prince of Wales. So they were important people in the area and really seemed to be quite natural leaders of men. And so King Edward did his best to keep the Welsh at bay, but really what it turned into was that his men were in their castles while the Welsh raiders um, went stealing what they could off of the English. So he offered a full pardon to all Welshmen except the Tudors because he knew they were the leaders. And on a quiet Good Friday April morning in 1401, while the garrison was praying at mass, the castle was left defended only by the gatekeepers. And it's said that some carpenters arrived to do some work. Uh, they were known to the gatekeepers who happily let them in and were rewarded by promptly being murdered. And the garrison returned from the chapel to find that they were locked out of their own castle, which was now in the hands of the Tudors and the small, unruly band of freedom fighters. And a chap you might have heard of called Sir Henry Hotspur was given the job of recapturing the castle from the Tudors. His first attempt at putting it to siege was a miserable failure. So after waiting as long as he could be bothered to, he decided to concede and pardoned everyone, including the Tudors, and allowed them to go away on the promise never to return. Of course, the Tudors soon forgot about that and they continued to be rebels with Owen Glendower and Sadly, the two of the eldest brothers were eventually captured and executed by the king's men. The youngest Tudor brother, Meredith, fled to London with his little son, Owen Ap Meredith Ap Tudor. Now, I'd like to explain that in Welsh, Ap means son of, and they didn't use surnames which confused the English who simplified his name to Owen Tudor. Looking back at the records of the time, I can see that it's often spelt Tidder, either with T-I-D-D-E-R or with a Y, T-Y-D-E-R. So we could have had the Tidder dynasty today, or more properly, we should have called it the Meredith dynasty. But there we are. Anyway, it's a mystery what became of Owen's father or his mother back in Wales, but Owen became a squire with King Henry V's bowmen in France. He would have been a boy, basically, and um, he wouldn't have been fighting in the action, but he would have been uh, putting arrows into quivers and really making the tea. And eventually he became a squire to a knight which is quite a good job and uh, well paid and responsible 
And that night was Sir Walter Hungerford, who was steward of the king's household, so he was quite senior. He was also the constable of Windsor Castle. So King Henry V, as you might know, died of the flux, a horrible disease like dysentery while he was besieging another castle in France. And Owen returned with Sir Walter and he secured the odd sounding position of master of the Queen's wardrobe. Now, uh, there weren't any wardrobes involved, uh, not as we know them today, but it was a very important position because his job was to look after the valuables, jewels, gowns, anything of importance of the widowed and lonely young queen Catherine of Valois. He would have seen her pretty much every day and the combination of a handsome young Welshman and a beautiful young widowed queen worked its magic. No one believed that the queen would fall in love with her servant or that he would have the nerve to marry her in secret. In 1422, the Welsh were still, they weren't even second class citizens, they were third class citizens, um, not allowed to carry a sword or own land or any public office. And um, some historians point out that there are no records of this marriage. But I believe that if any of Edmund Tudor's enemies thought he was illegitimate, they would have used this to make a lot of trouble for his son, Henry Tudor, in later life. I also discovered in my research that they were helped by Queen Catherine's confessor, Bishop Philip Morgan of Ely. Now, he was a Welshman and he was wealthy enough not to need Cardinal Beaufort's support or anyone's support. And he was influential, so it would be easy for him to protect them. And Bishop Morgan let them live at his own house. It was a bishop's palace that he didn't use that often because it was out in the country. And he spent most of his time either at Ely or in London. But I'm certain that he wouldn't have condoned this if they weren't married in the eyes of God. And in my book, Bishop Morgan says, it's a manor house in a village called Much Haddam in Hertfordshire. Out of sight is out of mind, Tudor, remember that. They will have their hands full with the coronation in France and will be too busy to go searching for the mother of the king. The story of how Owen and Catherine founded the Tudor dynasty is told in Owen, book one of the Tudor trilogy, set against the background of the conflict between the houses of Lancaster and York which develops into what we now know as the Wars of the Roses. Owen's story deserves to be told and I'd like to think my books help to preserve his place in our history. I'd like to end this podcast by saying that the device of Owen Tudor, that's his personal heraldic badge, is a martlet which signifies his restless quest for knowledge, learning and adventure. Please visit my website, tonyriches.com, where you can find details of all of my books, as well as a gallery I'm developing of relevant photos and images. The next podcast in this series will be about Owen's son, Jasper Tudor, whose story of survival and victory against impossible odds is told in book two of the Tudor trilogy. Thank you for listening.